Good evening, everyone, and welcome to your Scottish Parliament. My name is Maggie Chapman, MSP, and I'm a director of the Scottish at the Scotland's Futures Forum. It's really, really great to be able to bring this conversation to, to life here this evening. Artificial intelligence, as we know, is something that terrifies many of us and absolutely delights uh, many of us as well. I think I sit somewhere in both camps most of the time. Um, I'm really excited by the opportunities that it presents for our society, but I'm very aware of the, the challenges and risks that it presents to us as well. This year, in our Festival of Politics, we are in our 19th year of thought-provoking discussion and debate, informing people and engaging people, we hope, from all, all walks of life, all ages, and all across, all across the country. And today is the third of three days of, of discussion and, and debate we've had, and I hope you've been able to enjoy a few other bits and pieces um, over the last, last two and a half days as well. I look forward to the discussion uh, that we have th th this evening, and we probably won't always agree if, if I can ask if we keep our discussions and uh, contributions uh, respectful, even, even, even where those disagreements um, do, do occur and those differences of opinions do, do occur. We are very pleased that you are here to join us in this Where are the Ethics in Artificial Intelligence discussion in partnership with the University of Edinburgh. Later, I will be inviting you to get involved with the comments and questions. We want, we want this to be a discussion rather than just you listening to, 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 to us on, on the panel. But you are also very welcome to contribute online um, via the, the platform that used to be called Twitter. Um, if you go to at visit Scott Powell, you can contribute in the discussion there. And there, there, there's a whole host of other uh, online platforms as well that, that we've, been, um, we, we've, we've been participating in over the last few days. We'll also be on the Parliament's TV channel as well, SPTV. So, so welcome to all of those who are joining on, online. I'm very pleased this evening to be joined by Brian Hills, Dr. Atusha Kazir Zadeh, um, who is joining us online, and Professor Georgios Leontidis. Brian is Chief Executive of the Data Lab, which is Scotland's innovation centre for data and artificial intelligence. Atusha is a Chancellor's Fellow in the Philosophy Department and the Edinburgh Futures Institute at the University of Edinburgh. Her, her research is on ethics, safety, the philosophy of AI, philosophy of science, and their intersection with socio-political philosophy and philosophy of language. Georgios is a prof professor of machine learning and the director of the Interdisciplinary Centre for Data and AI at the University of Aberdeen. His research interests revolve around foundations of machine learning, AI for agri-food sustainability, AI ethics, and AI for industrial applications. So I'm sure we'll have a, a wide-ranging discussion. But to kick things off, if I, if I can put a couple of questions to our panel members, could you give us an overview of some of the things that AI is currently capable of and is currently doing? And how are, how are we using it? What, what does it benefit our lives at the moment? And Brian, if I can start with you. Uh, thanks, Maggie, and hello, everyone. So. Um, in the Data Lab, we uh, work on a lot of collaborative projects between our universities and industry uh, in data and AI, um, and lots of examples from different sectors in the application of this now. For example, you'll probably see quite a lot in the news coming through about the use of AI to help healthcare. Um, I think there's a recent example in Aberdeen, actually, on, on breast uh, screening, breast cancer screening breakthroughs, and the use of AI to identify anomalies in images and flag them to uh, surgeons and clinicians to look further into as well. And we're also seeing uh, applications in manufacturing for predictive maintenance and, and analytics of machines, um, and lots of different uh, sectors and climate as well. We're starting to see it used in terms of climate modelling and, and various other things. So um, as, I guess, uh, we started Data Lab nine years ago, we were kind of in that big data hype circle cycle when everybody's talking about all of the data and what we could do, we're kind of going into the hype cycle of AI at the moment, or the next wave of AI as I call it, because uh, it started many years ago research in this field, and we're starting to see some of the practical applications come through that, uh, and, and I'm sure we'll get into the challenges, and there's significant challenges around that too. Thanks very much, Brian. 
George, in your work, where, where have you come across sort of really quite powerful uses of AI? Definitely. I think um, a very exciting area which um, has been quite um, important over the past decade is also the application of AI for forecasting. So we have some uh, successful stories of how you can predict, uh, say, you know, strawberry yield for production or you can also um, predict biodiversity uh, loss. So it has a clear and direct involvement in climate crisis, for instance, if you were to mitigate the, the you know, possible bad effects of, of climate crisis. Um, we've seen cases where we can use machine learning for uh, predicting anomalies in nuclear reactors so that we can you know, predict events that might happen, uh, which, as you can imagine, nuclear industry, uh, you know, a potential uh, event can have very severe consequences. Um, of course, autonomous driving, perhaps you've seen, you know, the electric vehicles like the likes of Tesla and Lucid and other uh, brands, many of the systems that they are used in the background are you know, AI systems for object detection, these computer vision systems, they can identify pedestrians or objects and they have systems in the background to avoid those objects. And obviously other cases, as uh, Brian mentioned before, we have for asset management, uh, you know, we have been working with uh, large companies like Siemens for developing systems to predict emissions and gas turbines. So then we have applications that have a direct uh, industry benefit. And in the past, we've done stuff with uh, refrigeration systems. We had a very big project with Tesco where we were able to um, create a system that can automate the scheduling process of defrosting cycles of fridge and freezes. And then you can imagine that being able to have those applications uh, can have a financial benefit for the companies, but also uh, environmental benefits, given that you, know, you might be able to reduce carbon emissions. And that has you know, a very important uh, factor that we have to, to consider. Th thanks very much. And uh, Atisha, w welcome. I if I can come to you. Well, we've, we've heard of some of the scare stories around AI being you know, threatening our, our very existence and leading to extinction. Do you, do you share any, any of those, those those concerns, or where, where do you see the value of, of AI? Well, so I think at its core, AI um, means algorithms, and we've had algorithmic systems, artificial intelligence systems since 1954 and onwards. And then there's been, as the um, other panelists mentioned, various different uh, cycles, very different su success stories. And lots of work for decades has been done about the social implications of artificial intelligence systems. Um, I personally have worked on the social implications of recommender systems, so how artificial intelligence systems are used in social media and how they can sometimes so socially manipulate us, how can they result in polarization. So these are some of the negative implications of uh, some of these systems that um, are used to connect us and are used to uh, facilitate our uh, uh, network connection to the other people. Um, and then also, of course, uh, the, uh, and the kind of ri uh, rise of generative um, artificial intelligence models, um, in particular, the public release of ChatGPT has made um, AI, uh, like this generation of AI, of course, accessible to, to the public. And there are a lot of uh, very serious social questions about um, how these systems might uh, result um, in the displacement of um, some labor sections, how they can kind of, again, increase um, and speed up um, the social manipulability, um, the, the, the positioning of different people in different filter bubbles, because you can uh, generate uh, realistic content by these models uh, very uh, easily um, um, and then basically they can, you can target people by different kinds of content, personalized content. So these are um, all social um, kind of like uh, questions about the social implications of the systems and um, sometimes you might think okay if these social implications um, in a negative way kind of speed up in, in the society uh, they might uh, very much break up the uh, uh, the, the kind of uh, democratic societies that we have set up, right? Because if you are, if you lose your capacity to um, to distinguish between a truthful or true information as compared to a, a made-up information by a generative model, if you 
um, if you can't kind of like trace where do these uh, informations are coming from. And then if, of course, um, in some sections people uh, lose their jobs without um, society having thought about replacement for their positions, we can think that um, societies um, in an accumulative way can go into a chaotic situation. And so then um, that can result in, in, in some uh, national and, and global chaos. So discussions about existential um, threats of artificial intelligence um, you know, can be interpreted in so many different ways. Uh, some of those ways are uh, very speculative. Um, and some of those ways, I think, um, when basically these existential problems um, are understood in terms of an accumulation of many other ethical problems, um, I think uh, they, they deserve attention. Thanks, Vera. You spoke there about the use of AI to manipulate and to to make make people believe or think differently. And I, and I suppose one of the one of the questions or one of the challenges were things like deep fakes and the, the, the sort of a representation of reality that is not real at all. How, how in, in, from a philosophical a, a angle, how does that change, in your view, what, what it means to be human? Um, I think that a, that's a great question. And again, we've had this deep fake technology since, um, since, let's say, a decade ago. But now, with the rise of these generative models, um, it is possible to create this deepfake technology um, and the deepfake content much faster and then embed that into social media, like spread that much quicker. Mm -hmm. And I am personally very concerned about the epistemic confusion that uh, we, might, uh, we might be situated in if this deepfake content is uh, produced and, and is spread more quickly. Um, and so, of course, if we go into a situation of epistemic confusion, uh, gradually, uh, we can't like we we might gradually lose the sense of uh, trusting in each other, trusting in different uh, democratic institutions, and many things that uh, you know throughout time, different human societies have set up as um, ideal organization, ideal institutions um, that kind of give us meaning to be human. I think those would all be kind of like challenged. So um, basically, I think uh, in short, then this deep, deep fake content can impact very seriously um, the, the sense of trust that we've had in, in other people, in institutions, in democracy, in different values that we always thought are good human values. And also they might um, kind of this deep fake content again might uh, kind of at an individualistic level make us very epistemically confused. And I think those are uh, very challenging um, kind of situations. And, and those aspects of human, what does it mean to be a human, uh, would be uh, would be affected by this technology. Okay, thanks. And Brian, if if I can, following on from that, I suppose there's a relationship between how we understand how data is used in, in the round and and its use, abuse, misuse um, in, in an artificial intelligence sense. Where where do you think, uh, where where do you think, other than deep fakes and that? capacity to manipulate, where, where, where are the areas for concern that, that, that you see coming out of this? Yeah, I, th I think there's lots of areas that are under research just now, um, areas such as bias in the data sets, um, uh, and then there's influencing the outcomes uh, of people's analysis. And um, I think something that changed my viewpoint significantly on this was actually way back in 2016. So, uh, what, uh, as Atusha had said, you know, a lot of this stuff has been around for a while, but it's coming to the fore just now through the press and various other means. But, um, you know, I spent my life in industry doing data analysis, running data teams, building software, and I moved to the data lab. And then this book came out in 2016 called Weapons of Math Destruction by Cathy O'Neill, how big data could drive inequality and um, <coughs> impact democracy. And as somebody who'd been working in the field, I never even thought about the side effects of this stuff before, uh, or through that type of lens. Um, and you know, you've seen a lot of books and research from that point that I've been aware of um, that are really opening the door on, on this, um, like Invisible Women uh, as well. Um, and uh, uh, Technology is Not Neutral by Stephanie here. Actually, when I was writing these things down and prepare, preparing for this, the thing that I noticed was they're all written by women. Which I think is a great thing, um, especially, uh, and we might get into it, a lot of the narrative in AI um, or the language we use is, is, is misused, I think. So talking about godfathers, I don't think is helpful. 
Uh, talking about hallucinations, I don't think it's helpful. Talking about existential risk, well, let's look at Hawaii, or let's look at Europe, or let's look at Canada burning just now. You know, climate is ex existential. So I think that's kind of leading me into also the language and how we portray this stuff. I think uh, it's really important for us working in the field, like many people are doing, to kind of um, uh, bust some of the myths around this to have a proper debate about it. And on that point about language and, and the power of of fear, actually, that language can convey. So just what, what, what are the things that we, we need to be considering when we, when we think about machine learning, when we, when we think about how we get rid of bias in, in that learning process? Yeah, definitely. That's a, that's a very big topic. And I think I'm very happy that uh, Atusa introduced quite a, a few topics around this area, because uh, I think it's very important to understand that sometimes we speak about ethics and we disconnect the, the ethics side of things or, or responsible AI or transparent AI with the technical side of, of AI, as, as if they were two different things. But actually, there are two things or multiple things that have to coexist and they have to be considered when we conceptualize new technology. And I think um, one of the main problems that we have at the moment is that all of these tools that have come um, out in the past few months, like ChatGPT and DALI and stable diffusion models that can generate uh, images and, and text, they have been made available to the public and anybody can use that with, without any, any safeguards. And, and they are very cheap to use. That's another thing that's kind of, kind of new for us. In the past, technology existed and there could be deep fakes, but it was very hard for you know, the public to find those tools, to use them, to download them, to go through the whole process of, of using them, whereas at the moment, everything is free for, for consumption. So from my perspective, I think it's very important as we move towards an accelerated progression of AI, because I think what we've seen in the past year it has been an unprecedented um, explosion of, of new techniques. And, and of course, we have the headlines about ChatGPT, but you have to appreciate that in the background, there's sort of you know, a huge amount of, of work that has gone into from companies, from universities, and I think catching up with this progress is, is very hard. So even if we start today to regulate or define an, an ethics framework for ChatGPT as we know it today, maybe until we've had this framework established, maybe we've moved on. And then we always have to catch up. And that, that cannot happen. So I think we need to kind of shake the foundations of what we do at the moment, uh, reestablish the way we do stuff, and then have ethics and, and responsibility around AI to be the main blocks, and then the technical contributions, the technical developments have to follow through uh, those lenses. Otherwise, you know, there's going to be always the catch up, you know, uh, you know, which is not going to be a nice way to see the AI developments in the future. I think, from, from my perspective. Okay, thank you. I could go on asking questions all night, but I, I'm, I'm aware that that's not my job. So uh, to open it up to you, happy to take questions or comments from, from, from any of you. Please just raise your hand. We do have a roving mic um, to, to come to you. If you can keep your comments or questions briefish, then that means we can get more discussion in. Uh, I've got somebody right, right at the front. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much to all the panelists. That this is a very good uh, conversation. I think we need another day for this kind of topic because we won't be able to fill, we won't be able to exhaust all our questions. I've got one burning question um, because I am actually a master's in data science student and I hate AI because of the ethics around it. I'm quite cynical about it. And I know because I work with a lot of data and there's a lot of issues around data privacy. But my question is for people like yourselves, Brian, because you've got influence in your position. Where are we Scotland in terms of actually cultivating education and awareness of supporting people and supporting organizations to handle privacy, to be able to ensure that users are not vulnerable because of these apps and this AI that's coming out? Brian. Yes, good question. Um, well, I'll just give you an example from, from the data lab perspective. So, you know, there's, as you know, there's lots of people doing masters in data science right now across Scotland uh, and the world. And, and we have funded over a thousand students now across 13 universities in Scotland. And what the pattern that we saw as we were doing calls for universities to take the scholarships is when we ask for how are you teaching ethical uses of data, um, quite a few didn't answer the question. Uh, some would answer it and talk about research ethics, which is great stuff. But the thing that alarmed me was how are we educating people and the students coming through to know about the choices that they're making when they're using and handling data. You know, um, 
if I was to think back to last century when I started out in this stuff, um, I was dealing with SMS data from phones and decoding messages and doing various other things for network operators. I was never given any guidance on what I could and could not do with the data. Um, and so for the students that we're involved in, we make it mandatory that they need to do a data and AI ethics course. Our first one was created by our colleagues at University of Edinburgh. And if you receive government funding, you needed to do this. Uh, and we're evolving that programme at the moment. So I think from university education, what I would like to see, because a master's is very condensed, as you know, it's very intense. You're learning a toolbox of techniques with often very clean data. Um, so you can learn that is actually building these things into an interdisciplinary approach. So you have knowledge from other faculties and departments, um, as I'm sure George and, and uh, Katusa could talk about, um, to learn uh, about how to do this responsibly. Um, and I also think, um, you know, there's value in, in learning about history and learning about arts and humanities because we're creating these technologies to benefit humanity, apparently. Um, but we need to learn about the side effects from history of bringing new technologies in, etc. And the thing that concerns me is if we're spending a lot of time teaching data science to people and they've got the toolbox, they don't know the right ways and the wrong ways to apply it. Uh, and I think that's definitely an area we need more focus on. Atusa, can I come to you? What, 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 what's in that toolbox? How, how do we discern what is a right or wrong way to use these technologies? Uh, um, I actually want to say two things. So one is that um, I think this is a sociological issue that every couple of years we start using different labels for the same set of uh, technical tools, right? So when you say you do data science, you definitely also, like the study of data science includes the study of AI, although for various sociological reasons, we might have a master's in AI versus a master in, in data science. Again, when we go back to the history, like a, a artificial intelligence is a field in which many different people try to design different algorithms in order to add, automate different aspects of human reasoning. And so whenever we, we, we use statistical tools, um, we, we design algorithms that employ statistical tools to analyze data, we are using some version of artificial intelligence. So I think we need to kind of maybe first demystify this notion of artificial intelligence as being some very special things. Like algorithmic reasoning, I think, according to many different textbooks, are um, instances of artificial intelligence reasoning. And um, I also, maybe this is like a personal response. Um, I, I think it is unfortunate that um, this whole label of AI ethics was put um, on a lot of efforts that people were really trying to do in order to cultivate this uh, mentality of thinking about the social implications of technology. Um, so ethics uh, could mean just normative ethics, and normative ethics is a theory of how we have to do the morally permissible thing, right? Like there are Kantian uh, theories and deontological theories, utilitarian theories, and different virtue ethics, and etc. cetera. Um, and so a couple of people try to kind of build moral machines, meaning that they try to take those ethical theories into the way the machine is doing reasoning. But that's a very small part of like AI ethics. A lot of AI ethicists, um, in my understanding um, in this community, um, are really trying to actually um, understand that the data sets that they are working on does not include implicit biases, whether it is in natural language processing applications or healthcare applications. Uh, there are so many examples showing that uh, computer scientists, data scientists, artificial intelligence researchers figured out that the way they have, uh, for example, formulated an objective function, loss function, does not really capture something out there in the reality. So in, in reality, AI ethics, um, again, on my view, really means that we need to um, cultivate everyone who is designing uh, the systems uh, with, uh, with tools that allows them to, to, to do critical critical reasoning why they are designing the systems why they are um, um why they are analyzing different kinds of data they need to make sure that there's enough transparency available uh, they need to be very critical about the implicit biases they need to ask these 
all of these kinds of questions. And so um, um, here at the, at the University of Edinburgh, when we teach courses on um, AI and data ethics, actually we, we bring most of the time these two together. So there is a master's program that will be launched from this September on AI and data ethics. We really try to um, give the students various different critical skills um, in order to uh, kind of um, uh, like to employ when they want to design data and AI kind of ecosystems. So ethics in AI ethics really means uh, tools from social sciences, humanities, anthropology, critical studies that allows AI researchers and data scientists to think very critically and carefully about what they are designing. It's, it's interesting what you say there about, you know, it's almost we've, we've created the problem of maybe fear around ethics and AI because of the language and the, and the, the groupings that, that we've used. I, I'm wondering whether you have a sense to sort of where, where, that, where that comes from, because just thinking of some, some of the other, another very big sort of policy area or, or an area that directly affects all of our lives is urban planning for instance, and yet we don't talk about the ethics of urban planning, but where you put the local hospital, where you put an out-of-town shopping centre has you know, drastic ramifications for how people can and can't live their lives, and yet we never talk about the ethics of urban planning. How is it that we've got ourselves into a position of problematising the ethics of AI, do you think? So, um, the way I understand the field is that uh, there were a lot of uh, problematic instances of the deployment and development AI systems that were reported by many different journalists, right? So, the, most of the examples, or a lot of the examples that we refer to were actually uh, formulated and brought to the attention of the public. Uh, by a lot of like investigative journalists originally. And basically, again, the concern um, are about the social implications of this technology. So if you are developing a system that, for example, uh, tries to understand or, or basically extract information about uh, uh, whether a woman is applying for, or uh, a, a woman of minorities applying for a credit card as compared to a white man, and the system is allowed to kind of capture those information based on the browsing data of, of this person, and then would recommend two very different kinds of credit card example or um, uh, options, alternatives to these different two people, it means that there is something wrong. Why the system mm -hmm. is doing this bias in offering just two different kind of alternatives, right? This is one example. Then there was this huge like array of different examples, many different cases, very, very interesting case study published um, in, in science. A couple of journalists uh, saw that actually in the, in the US across hospitals, they're using a specific system that uh, systematically biases against uh, black people, black Americans, when it wants to allocate special um, uh, medical kind of like uh, facilities, um, like if there's a white American, black American systematic bias. And so there were all of these kind of like um, problematic cases. Um, people realized that actually um, this, the social implications of this um, advanced algorithmic systems, again, meaning AI, um, are, are very myriad and we have to kind of like start studying them. And, and then there were many different kinds of communities that came together uh, studying fairness, accountability, transparency of the system. But then they just realized that actually uh, it is like it is getting like much broader than that. Um, so in your in your question about the ethics of urban planning, obviously we don't talk about ethics of many things, but yeah. we talk about ethics of uh, weapon developments, right? Uh, I mean Oppenheimer, <laughs> like mm -hmm. it's one example of it where you just see how a scientist or a group of scientists needed to deal with all of these ethical trade-offs and, and how difficult and complicated that has been. Um, so a lot of technological, um, I think, advances um, had uh, with themselves uh, various ethical and, and safety questions. And again, if we interpret ethics in terms of social implication concerns, then we just realize, okay, everyone who is dealing with AI systems or advanced algorithmic systems need to reflect on social implications of this system. So everyone needs to kind of do AI ethics or be familiar with AI ethics in some, in some level. 
and I suppose that that really gets to the heart of the question: is how do we how do we raise that awareness? George, in in your research and in, in the work that you have done, and the people that that you are you work with, do you see that recognition and that the, the acknowledgement of the need for a greater awareness of criticality, a greater awareness of that critical reasoning that Atusa talked about? Yeah, that's definitely the, the case. I think it, it's crucial to kind of reflect on, on one uh, other element: is that Sometimes we make the assumption that when we have a system developed like ChatGPT, you know, for generating language, uh, that people are aware, even the, the developers, of the limitations and limits of those technologies. But it's not actually the case. So, even as we speak, there is no accepted framework to evaluate those systems. So, even the developers of this technology, they don't know what are the full capabilities of those systems or where those systems might fail. And I think that has been one of the main arguments around why do we release those tools if we don't know what are the you know, implications of using it or the limits of using it, when they can go wrong, what consequences they can have. So I think we've seen in the university sector mainly and perhaps a bit less in industry that develops these technologies that we are paying a bit more attention to the you know, safety of AI systems and, and the possibility of AI systems. So when we teach students, you know, we go back to the basics, we speak about the data, but with respect to the ethics and the use of the data, why we use the data, who are the end users, the stakeholders, why we develop a system, how we can make a system more transparent so that it justifies the decision. Um, and I think Atusa touched before the, the problem of discrimination. Perhaps you have different groups of people, some minorities um, that they might be discriminated against. Um, so these are factors that we have to consider and have us use cases way before we develop the system. So when we are conceptualizing the system, before we put the effort to say, okay, let's find the data, let's program it, let's develop it, let's train it, we have to think, why do we do all of these things? Who are the stakeholders of this system, of this kind of technology that we're developing the tool? Who is going to use that tool? In what way is it going to be a mobile device, going to be a system that is in the background without any inspection, there's no human uh, you know, involved in the process as an AI system on its own making decisions or you may have the case where there's a human AI collaborative effort where you say you, there's a human and there's an AI agent and you know, both of them together they make an action, they make a decision. So then you have a human sort of supervising the AI system. But in most cases that we've seen in say ChatGPT again as an example, we don't have these cases. The, the tool is there, anyone can use that no matter how old you are, or how tech savvy you are, or who you are, it doesn't really matter. Anybody can use that. The point is, who is responsible and legally responsible about the consequences of what comes as an output of those systems? If a user takes that output as a given and uses it to do something else, so who is responsible? The developer of the technology, the user that used that, the, the data that were used into that. So these are kind of open questions that have a bit more, you know, legal side. But actually, there are open questions that the community is really trying to to debate and find a way uh, moving forwards. But it's, um, yeah, it's an ongoing exercise, I would say. But again, going back to my previous point, from a university perspective, I think we have a responsibility to reflect on those things. We have a responsibility to put these things in a very central, uh, on the central stage, so that we don't really let things you know, go adrift. OK. More questions, more comments from you. Uh, see, another one right at the front, if, if that's OK. If you can just wait for the microphone. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Cheers. Hi, I just wanted to ask about um, when we're on the subject of ethics and community and social problems, do you see that AI has now created a new class system? So you've got ed educational poverty and educational richness, so people are reacting differently to it. And basically things like the Trump campaign and things like that, AI is actually reaching more people who are educationally unaware of the logistics of AI than people who are at the top of the game who know exactly how it works and how they interact with it. So basically the people are going to go <laughs> that are going to actually mm -hmm. be destroyed or you know like um, have negative, benef negative effects of AI are actually quite a large part of the population and it's because they're in educational poverty about how AI can be used and, and its effects. Who wants to take that? Happy to Brian? Give a quick response to that. <coughs> no, no. no uh, happy to give a quick response to that. So, at the Data Lab, we partner with the Scottish Government to deliver the Scottish AI Alliance. Uh, and George is a member of the leadership circle as well. 
looking at how we can create trustworthy, inclusive and ethical AI for the country. And our key focus in the last two years, to be honest, has been community engagement, the societal engagement with children through to older people, through to people through the geographies of Scotland. Uh, and we're just about to launch a larger community engagement program looking at socio-economic groups as well uh, and an online living with AI course for anybody to understand the, the basics uh, in a, an easy to understand way for members of the public, um, much as the, the famous MOOC from Helsinki came out as well. Um, so th certainly within Scotland, it's a key focus for the work that we're doing with the government at the moment, uh, because we appreciate, you know, the, the challenge that you outlined there could easily happen uh, if we didn't actually be proactive on this. It is, I, I saw you wanting to come in too. Yeah, I, I think this is just such a fascinating question, and I, I actually really think all of the governments, uh, especially in the like the developed world, have have responsibility to to really enhance the, the the education, social education that they are providing to people about about AI systems, how they work, and you know how they trigger our, our cognitive biases. As you very correctly mentioned, many of the you know we are humans full of cognitive biases. Like our brain is full of cognitive biases, and that's how we function. And many of the systems like trigger our cognitive biases, right? So they, for example, try to. Uh, trigger how we uh, how we want to pay attention how we feel happy when we pay attention to specific things that we like and then more information are, are targeted at, at us so you are exactly pointing to like a very very important uh, kind of point uh, i think m more and more work uh, at different governmental levels should be done uh, to educate people and and i always think like you know instead of some of this uh, boring seri series that we are exposed to there would be more and more there needs to be more and more like series interesting educational programs evening programs on tv um, and different places where um all sectors in the in the um, in the world like all different age levels are exposed to this information because these are just out there are impacting all of us all ecosystems the way we learn the way we live the way we lose our jobs etc so it is just necessary for everyone to know to know the basics of um of this system so yeah i think i think that's just a great point and and this digital divide has always been there there are so many countries in the world who still do not have for various you know political sanction or computing limits do not even have access to uh for example chat gpt etc so there's a lot of work to do on that space to to educate people and ensure that the public knows what is really happening um uh, to us by the by the more and more advancements of this algorithmic reasoning system thank you more questions quite, quite a few hands yes uh that person just on, on the end row in the light light top Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon to you. Um, I have a problem with the definition of AI. AI isn't intelligent. It's something that's been worked on probably what you said for the past 60, 70 years, and we haven't really got very far. We've got some clever software, and I'll give you that, and some very quick software. Um, but I think we may be discussing the wrong thing. Maybe we should be, be discussing the ethics of the people who write this software that can generate this fake news, because that's what it seems to be being used for more than anything. Um, they thought that self-driving cars was going to be a simple problem. They are a long way away from self-driving cars. So I wonder how long it's going to be before we really do see proper AI that we can recognize as intelligent. And maybe then when we know what AI really is, maybe we should be discussing the ethics of it then. Because we're discussing something we don't have. Are we not? We're discussing something we don't have. Atisa, do you, do you want to come in on that one? Um, okay, so, so, so I, I disagree with you because, um, so what you, what you call real AI or proper AI is referred uh, to in the literature as artificial general intelligence or artificial super intelligence. And this is, artificial general intelligence has been this whole goal that was set by many, uh, by many different uh, uh, people who were theoretically trying to develop artificial intelligence systems. I totally agree with you that the term intelligence is 
is just such an unfortunate term the community has has used and has uh, has developed. Uh, some people uh, suggest sanctioning this term, so they say we should not refer to the term um, artificial intelligence. We should talk about algorithms, or we should talk about uh, capable machines and etc. Uh, but 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 the fact is that uh, like artificial intelligence is the discipline that many different. Uh, researchers developed and they are developing. So I, I am personally more interested in like trying to um, kind of uh, raise uh, awareness about the about the meaning of this term and all, all of the nuances that are that are around this. Uh, and I, I think actually the term artificial intelligence is like this, um, you know, metaphor that a lot of the people who were developing the systems try to try to use, and it it kind of function as like a futuristic concept for them. So they would develop develop some systems, and then because artificial intelligence is just the things in the future, uh, there's still a huge gap between what they are doing and want the, what they want to achieve, and that gap would motivate them to do more and more research. Uh, sociologically speaking, that's how I think about artificial intelligence. But, but I think you're totally right. When we look into different uh, psychological theories of intelligence, there are so many, right? And then even within the, the whole field of artificial intelligence, there are some people that try to develop artificial intelligence according to some purely formal mathematical models that have nothing to do with human intelligence. And some other people try to kind of make connections between the way our brain work and the ideas that intelligence somehow emerges. Uh, or is a byproduct of cognitive uh, functions in our brain, and so we can kind of like imitate that. So there are many different interpretations of of intelligence, but I think algorithmic systems that we have, sociologically speaking, have been called artificial intelligence systems, and uh, and that's an unfortunate fact, but that's a fact, and so I I think it's it's fine to use to use such words. George. Yeah, I think my point with that is that, yeah, we have been using AI as a buzzword, and that's, that's a reality. So I, I think you will see uh, many of us not really using any, I put myself in this category, I'm not using AI as my title or as my discipline. I speak about machine learning because we have machines and they learn something. Now, what they learn is debatable, right? So, and, and that is what we are discussing now uh, in this panel, that we have data, that we have some knowledge that we want to extract from the data, we want to develop a system to do X, and then we develop a system that has learned to do a very specific, narrow task. Whereas humans, in theory, we have better capacities in reasoning, we can you know, create an understanding of the space very quickly. I, I know if I have to exit this space, where I can go, so I'm not gonna crash someone, uh, unless there are some other issues behind that. So systems don't have this capability at the moment, and that's why some, some Critics about the models like ChatGPT is about the reasoning capabilities. That you are, we are seeing cases where ChatGPT is very successful. So you, you could then, if you have a, a paragraph written by ChatGPT about a topic, you would understand whether that is written by an AI system or, or, or a human. But then, in the, in the same kind of uh, situation, you might have you might rephrase your question to the system and might give you a completely different wrong answer as if it was a different person. So I think from my perspective, sometimes we, we speak about AI and, and we think that the AI system is kind of a, a replica or, or, or something that is equivalent to a human or, or one single person, but we kind of miss the, the perspective of how these systems have been developed, where they are digesting all of this data that is out there, and then they just learn, regurgitate information, they kind of fail, they, they, they succeed in some cases, they're, they're all over the place. And I think that's the main problem at the moment. The liability of those systems is, is, a, is a main concern. And, and the ethics for me go, you know, like it is in, it's part of that conversation, that like reliability, ethics, responsibility is for me, although different areas, they all has to be considered uh, you know, together, otherwise you're gonna create systems where are disconnected from each other. And you have the technical people developing systems and the ethicists looking at the ethics of those systems and the legal people looking at the legal implications and then no one speaks to each other and then, you know, you have plenty of catch up all the time. So that's why I think it's crucial to find a way of actually merging and, you know, bringing people together and make this, uh, you know, these systems a bit more transparent and a bit more ethical than what they are at the moment. Just for the benefit of those who might not have heard that, the question, how far, how far away from, of, from those intelligent systems are we? From my perspective, um, 
how far we are, I think we go back to the discussion that we had you know, a few minutes ago about what intelligence is. is. So I think first we have to decide what do we define by intelligence, which are the, uh, you know, what, which of the definitions do we want to, to use when we define the system. Of course, the, the, you know, in the past there was a Turing test and still exists that, that defines whether uh, you can uh, differentiate between a human and AI system. Some, some people argue that uh, Turing test is, is, is long gone or ChatGPT has passed this test. Other, other will argue, no, that's not the case because you know, there are cases where you can trigger the, you know, the situation where the system will fail the Turing test. Um, I believe that we are quite a long way from having an AGI system is what uh, Atus had defined before, like a system that uh, you can say that has the same amount or the same principles of intelligence like, like humans. So I think we are, from my perspective, decades away from uh, achieving something of, of this capacity. Do you want to come in on any of this? Or? Uh, I'm not going to give a number. I, I don't know is the honest <laughs> answer, I'll just be honest. Um, I think maybe one point I'd just like to pick on, when you're talking about software engineers, I think Scotland faces a choice right now. Um, we have invested £42 million in the Tech Scaler scheme, which is great. We've got a massive focus on entrepreneurship across the country. Um, and I think the debate and the choice we have is the playbook we want to use to make that successful. So a lot of people are focusing on the Silicon Valley playbook. You know, you could ask valid questions. Was that successful in the social media age? Do we feel that was a good outcome for humanity? Um, what do we learn from that if we were going to adopt it in Scotland or should we adopt it, etc.? because data scientists in the real world are working with product managers, software engineers, uh, lots of other people to ship product to make profit at the bottom line. Um, and uh, you know, how we do this is really important and we're coming to the inflection point of really going for this in our country right now. So you know, I think a good point for our future debate is how do we do that responsibly? Back to you for more questions or comments. Somebody just on, on the end in the middle there. Yeah. Hi, yeah. Um, my question is about um, what I feel is a very real threat uh, to jobs presented by AI. Um, it's great that all people studying data science are doing a module in ethics, but we're living in a time where there's a fairly woeful lack of um, regulation on large corporations. So what actual barriers are there right now and potentially coming up in the future to stop large companies doing fairly cutthroat cost cutting when it could save them a hell of a lot of money? Uh, there's been the, just as an offhand example, Netflix just advertising a $900,000 salary AI position in the midst of the Hollywood um, SAG strikes. I'm not necessarily saying that job is going to be writing shows and losing writers' jobs, but, you know, that kind of thing. What, you, what hope really is there for really solid regulation if it's not done at a kind of industry level uh, in these really big corporations? Thank you. And, and I suppose th th there's also maybe within that question a question about timing, because government regulation often lags way behind um, at the development of any technology, you know, the technology happens first and then regulations might catch up at some point. Brian, do you, do you want to, to take a first stab at this one? Yes, uh, <laughs> and then I'll, I'll let the, the other panellists improve dramatically on it. Um, yeah, I mean, we're definitely seeing changes right now, you know, uh, in call centres, for example, because uh, it's very defined use cases for calls coming in, etc. Uh, chatbots are replacing a lot of the investment that's been made in large call centres. Um, so there's uh, uh, emerging use cases that this is being applied to to drive uh, efficiencies in organisations. But it's also creating uh, new roles as well. We're working with a company who um, are doing thermal imaging uh, of Scotland's housing stock in order that it can be better insulated. Um, and they employ a lot of people to look at the images that are scanned and then crop bits out of it. Um, and we've automated that using a machine vision algorithm, but those people have been retrained and they're now growing their data analytics side of that um, to uh, grow their business and get through the housing stock in Scotland a lot quicker. So there's, there's, there's pros and cons, but I think it opens it up to the whole debate about regulation and what actually can governments do. And that is the hot topic of the day because um, you've got China are focusing on this, we've got US, 
focusing on it, we've got the EU focusing on it, the EU speaking to uh, uh, the US and the UK not involved in it, then you've got the UK talking about an AI summit in the fall, uh, and, uh, and lots of discussion what actually can be done here. Interplayed with some of the largest companies in the world, lobbying the prime ministers and the presidents, etc. And you may have seen in the White House last month, President Biden with seven of leaders of the biggest AI companies in the world, who happen to all be men again, you know, and you've got to wonder about the, the level of conversation uh, at a government level, and there's much more work to do. But I'll just set that out there for the others to add a lot more wisdom to it. <laughs> George, do you want to take, take that next, and then I'll bring in... No, yeah, yeah, definitely. Th that's, a, that's a big thing, but I think another uh, angle to this problem is, is the fact that automation uh, in general is not something new, right? So, so we've seen... Uh, for decades, how our, our lives have changed because we are, you know, have systems that, you know, are auxiliary systems. Even during the pandemic, you, you've seen that suddenly we went to kind of remote working and we have systems in place like Zoom and Teams. Uh, even today, Atusa is not with us, but we can easily have you with us. Um, so there are, there are always the pros and cons with any technology. So I think from my perspective, we have to start from that point that any new technology or any new system will benefit something, but we might have negative implications, something else. So I would like to dismiss technology because it will have a negative consequence by default, but we have to sit down and, and think what are the pros and cons. And if the, you know, if the pros are, are more than the cons, then we, we move ahead or, or, or the other way around. So I think it's inevitable that any technology or any new system will replace someone or, or, or something, right? Uh, the point is, how do we make that in a way where it actually empowers someone else? Or, you know, we create a system where, say in this case through Data Lab or other initiatives in Scotland or in the UK where we upskill people or we skill people. So to think of, of the next generation or the current generation, how we can, um, you know, develop a, a situation where they can learn new skills and they can support this, this ecosystem. So I wouldn't take personally the side of the things that because a technology will have negative consequences for a certain case, we dismiss the technology altogether, even if we have the evidence that, that says that um, there are other you know, uh, people or situations where the technology can have a positive side of things. So just to answer a bit more um, you know, accurately, the, precisely the question, I think we're gonna have several cases that, and several examples like that in the near future where we're gonna be discussing about BT, for instance, they announced about the anticipated until 2030 to have several thousand, 55,000 50, 55, jobs, 000 jobs yeah. uh, replaced. So this type of news uh, is, is not gonna be, you know, um, very rare cases, they're gonna be quite common, but the point is what do we do to mitigate that in a way where actually we um, adopt technology, but actually we find a way to support the people that might be displaced because of the technology. And I suppose there's also something around the, the, the quality of jobs that are being replaced. If they are pretty, you know, mechanical, for want of a better word, or, or not very fulfilling for people, actually, why shouldn't we replace the, those jobs? You know, th there's the argument with that. I think your, your question, though, around screenwriting, around the arts and around culture, Architects I think... Architects as well, mm. all sorts of jobs. I mean, my partner... Hang on for the mic. It's just behind you. Sorry, just, I, I, you know, yeah, I mean, it's like, I mean, what I was meaning is, you know, it's much more than automation now, you know, there's an article just came out that AI is now able to do a huge amount of the workload of what a lot of architects do and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. it's become much more than, you know, manual labor jobs, which are also really important as a source of employment for many yeah. people. But it's becoming a whole other thing where all sorts of, you know, what are deemed, you know, skilled jobs are, are also a threat. So, um, yeah, so that's kind of why I was saying it's quite pervasive and uh, what the barriers are and so on. Yeah, no, no, thank you. Uh, uh, Tusha, uh, Tusha, do you want to, to come in on, on this? And the, the, I suppose there are different elements to this. There, there's the different types of jobs, but there's also, as Georgia said, how we what we do for the people who are losing their jobs, but also what are the benefits of, of AI in employment? Yeah, if, if that's okay, I wanna uh, kind of start from like the first uh, great question that was uh, that was asked about, about the regulation. And I think we can look into the regula 
like questions around regulation at many different stages. Like at a very macro stage, like what I observe is that there are there are two very very main players. Uh, one is the United States, like Silicon Valley, right? Like all of these big tech companies are literally based there. Like companies that are introducing this uh, interesting disruptive technologies are based there, even like DeepMind is now owned by uh, by like Google, right? So it looks like there is this like asymmetry of power. Uh, we have like United States, the way they think about human values, the way they think about uh, their role in the world, like being maybe the best, one of the best players. And then, and then the kind of like a competition that they are in very implicitly, sometimes explicitly, uh, with China, and it looks like a lot of the decisions they are making is based on this um, this underlying assumption that we want to remain the best in the world, we want to remain number one in the world. And we observe this very explicitly, for example, when Sam Altman goes to the Senate and, and kind of like um, he um, he is talking to many different uh, legislators there, he he's just saying that I'm very, I'm very proud and I'm very glad that we are making this in America and this is a great nation. And so so this kind of like uh, perspective really underlies this macro level assumptions about like let's innovate because we want to remain number one in the world for various reasons. So, so then in that sense, the other other entities in the world, um, of course, from again this macro perspective, need to take some sides, right? So, United uh, Kingdom, for example, is now going for this like pro innovative approach that, in my an analysis and understanding, is is closer to. Um, to the to the to the U.S. kind of approach to regulation, like um, like let's innovate, like minimal regulation. Uh, there are talks about like let's regulate, but but there are a lot of tensions, a lot of paradoxes that are unresolved. Um, but then there are also these more uh, maybe um, interesting questions at a more like local level about how different kind of um, nations or countries try to try to work through these regulatory questions more more like locally. Um, again, we need to we need to accept and we need to acknowledge that there is this uh, like crazy power asymmetry um, in, in the world. This is that's visible and it looks like the US um, uh, is kind of dictating a lot um, how we should see things in the world. EU AI Act, of course, and EU in general is taking a different approach. And I think UK is is kind of like somewhere somewhere in the middle, um, but 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 yeah. So um, so then in the local local space, and there are a lot of like uh, questions, like a lot of different kind of sectors, unions uh, try to to push against um, against the invasion of this disruptive technology to the labor market. And I think um, that one of the one of the solutions that people are talking about is like this universal basic income that okay this this whole pandora box is open for example with the generative models and they are really going to take a lot of jobs and so maybe uh, we need to kind of give uh, give some uh, funding support to those people whose jobs are will be replaced maybe they can learn new new skills or or do new things uh, very interesting like theoretical idea there's been a couple of experiments about this i'm i'm not sure how in a like a, a large scale these ideas can be really uh, really deployed so yeah that's that's my take on this Got a follow up question from the regulation. Lots more questions. Um, I'll, I'll bring you in in a moment. I've, I've seen a couple of other hands coming up, which I think are also potentially linked. Um, at the back, just, just next to you. Yeah, thanks. Hi, um, just sort of following on to this, um, there's a lot of talk about how these kind of jobs in various sectors, um, architecture, art, manual labour, are going to be replaced by new jobs. But all these new jobs are going to be in a very specific sector, and those aren't necessarily going to be shared interests from those people whose jobs are lost. So I, I'm just kind of a bit concerned about not being very into tech, but being very into these things that I do see being taken. If you're not very interested in working in the tech sector, then that's the sector that's growing and pretty much all the others will, as a result of AI, be shrinking. So I'm just, yeah, I'm just mm -hmm. a bit concerned about that. Um, yeah. And I suppose maybe, maybe the, the follow on in, in terms of what, what we can control, what, what, are the, what are the regulatory measures we should be thinking about and should be thinking about now, rather than five, 10 years down the line, because yeah, th these things are happening now. Brian, do you have any, any sort of take on, on that? Yeah, so there's no doubt there's shifts um, going to happen. I think what I would look for is the evidence. 
okay, so it's easy enough to write an article on news at risk, etc., and get the news for the day. Um, but I just recall uh, when we were moving forward in machine vision and, and uh, scanning for various types of cancers, we said that radiologists would be obsolete in X number of years. Now in Scotland, we do not have enough radiologists to treat our people. Um, and so I think I would look to, you know, as a lot of the vendors are positioning this stuff now, is, is kind of co-piloting the professionals, actually a tool in their armory to do things faster, better, more accurate, etc. And so, you know, for me, I'm looking at the evidence, is that going to evolve over time? Or actually, are we seeing architects and others lose their jobs? I think, you know, it's hard to predict right now, if we're honest about it. So, so there's something about uh, roles and jobs actually enhancing and shifting rather than, than going going away completely, the, the example yeah, of radiologists. I mean, there, was a, there was a lot of talk about chat GPT replacing programmers. Right, and just tell the, the code you want to generate and it comes out and that was the headlines for a week and then everybody said actually what about X, Y, Z um, and proving that that wasn't quite going to be the case or could be the case uh, as well. So, you know, I, I think we, we need to uh, look at how this pans out over the, the longer term and take a kind of critical eye at the, the journalism, some of the journalism that's being posted on this stuff. Having said that, and back to a point that uh, Tusa made earlier on, you know, I think the role of journalism going forward is really important. Investigative journalism, mm -hmm. you know, from Carl Cadwalla in the Facebook uh, Cambridge Analytical piece through to the recent article in Time about the low-paid labour in Kenya that trains uh, OpenAI and other models from Silicon Valley companies. Um, so they, they train it with things that we wouldn't want to see coming out of those models. You know, the importance of journalism as we move forward, I think, for me, is, is really increasing. Mm -hmm. Okay. George, do you have any comment on, on that? Or um, just, just a quick addition, because I think it's quite important uh, for the rest of the discussion, is that uh, it's very important to understand that when we speak about AI systems, right, uh, we are sometimes quite wrongly using the AI term broadly. We established that before. But also, we assume that everybody agrees, even within the AI uh, community, about how things should, should, should move ahead. Actually, what happens at the moment is that if we see uh, the big universities you know, in the UK or in the US or, or elsewhere, you will see many AI developers or, or professors of AI, whatever, and, and ethicists to disagree, not only you know, the ethicists with the technical people of AI, but also within the technical developments of AI, people see things the different way. So there's no consensus even within the AI community about many of the stuff. So I think that's important to understand. Otherwise, we assume that everybody working on AI have a certain opinion and everybody else is, is opposite. Actually, that's not the case. You can see that half of those developing AI technologies disagree with the other half that develop AI technologies. And, and that has been a huge debate over the past year or so. So, so just clarify that because I think it's an important element to, to add to the discussion. And I, and I, I suppose your, your, your note of caution is, is, is well made if we look at other industries because there may be some, excuse me, some tech areas where roles develop and jobs change in a positive way. But in energy, for instance, We've not done energy transition jobs very well in the past. You just need to look at um, coal mining areas in Scotland. So, so th there is a, a note of caution there that we maybe need to hold, hold as, as we continue this discussion. More questions? I see somebody at the back on, on that side in the reddish top. Can I go back to the, the question of um, fake news and bias? <coughs> because I, th I think some of the comments that were made about bias at the beginning are, are really interesting and, and, and quite frightening, actually. My background is as a software developer, I don't think that the, the, the coding that's been done to code the advanced algorithms is the dangerous bit. Yes, you could subvert that, but actually I think it's the training of the models that's the dangerous bit. And I believe some of the, the larger players in the game that have trained their models aren't letting anybody know how they've done that. How do we tackle that challenge? Who wants to take that one? I couldn't, I couldn't Introduce. Start. Okay, yeah. go for it. Thank you. If, if I may. So, a couple of years ago, there was a kind of sort of debate on Twitter that was um, about uh, the sources of bias in the development of, of uh, AI systems. And there was um, you know, a group of people that said that uh, the only source of bias is in the data. So, there's a data bias. 
Uh, and others were saying that you can have algorithmic bias and data bias. So they were, you know, differing opinions about whether that, that's the case or, or not. I, I think the reality is that, um, and we see that in many real life applications, and, and, and a very good example for that is that when we develop AI system for any application, we try different models, right? So we don't say this is the correct model, just use that and, and go. And the reason for that is that each model and different types of models give us different results. If you go down to the nitty gritty, why that happens is that the way this model learns from the data, and the data don't change, the data is the same, right? So the model change is different. So practically, what the outcome is in this case is that the model performs differently, and that means has more bias, discriminates in specific groups of people. So then it's very hard to disconnect data bias and algorithmic bias. So, so, so that's why, from my perspective, that's my personal opinion, is that you can have sources of bias from both cases, right? Um, maybe kind of that answered partly your, your question, but I guess the main attention has been on the data side because I guess that's the elephant in the room. That's, that's the thing that in theory we can easier control, if I can say like that. So you can curate the data, you can be careful where you get this data from. Uh, if you create a, a system that is deployed, say, in a, in a healthcare domain, and you are training the model with data, say, from, from Edinburgh, and then you want to deploy this model to Greece, maybe you know, the populations are different, so you have population drift in this case. Maybe you need to do something better. So, so I think that's why data bias has been, maybe has taken a bit more of our attention, but I think we have to focus on both sources, in my view. I don't know if that answered your question or... Uh, Sushil, Brian, yeah, do you want to... Yeah, Sushil, if they want yeah. to come in the last one, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, I think um, there's um, the, there are a lot of trade-offs, and and like depending on how we address the trade-off, we might end up at, at different different points. So um, the, the the kind of narrative that goes at the moment is that uh, well, if we if we kind of like open source many of these systems, and if we um, kind of provide uh, details about how our systems are developed and and etc., then there would be some malicious users that would replay. Um, uh, or basically copy what we are doing, and and then they can they're the malicious users. So so AI can be used um, in um, in in two different ways for good or for bad. And so they're gonna use that for bad, and so that's gonna uh, really uh, like provide disadvantages to the society. Uh, so that's a, that's a kind of a narrative that uh, open AI that should be called closed AI has put forward. Uh, but then a lot of people are now trying to push for um, um, auditory mechanisms. So they say, okay, like um, you, you are not providing this kind of information for, for whatever reason, for all the reasons you say, but there should be some independent auditing uh, groups that would come and study our work and then ensure that a lot of checklists in relation to the data ecosystem and, and the development and deployment of these um, machine learning models are, are kind of in place. So I think... Uh, like trying to trying to go uh, like basically look at the problem you're asking from the auditing perspective, uh, then maybe some of the concerns that you're raising, of course, if that auditing group is very legitimate and has very high standards for analyzing the biases within the development of these systems, um, like could be could be like one solution to the to, to, to this issue of how we have to address the biases within these closed systems. Okay. Thank you. Yes, a quick question up here. Just following on from what Atusa said there and what Professor Elena has said. See, on the, you talked very early on in the conversation about ethics and how everybody needs to learn the ethics and train the system in an ethical way. But Atusa just mentioned malicious. I mean, I think we've seen from technology in the past and when changes in technology happen, uh, it never plays out well for the little guy, mm -hmm. is, is what I should say. It's basically, mm -hmm. um, you know, the first time they had a laser scanner at a supermarket, it didn't work. Now you can't, you can hardly see a person at a supermarket. That's coming. What if the person who's creating the AI just fundamentally is a bad actor? Mm -hmm. um, for example, say if you went to chat GPT, and just to take finance, which affects everyone, if you go to chat GPT and you put your prompt in and it says, please give me a list of the best financial products on the market. Mm -hmm. If chat GPT has a vested interest 
or if it has a prompt injector right at the start that says you will not you will not recommend any other uh, product except ours, then basically what you've got is a censorship of the first instance. Mm -hmm. That's the I'm going there to get information. I've got no way of knowing what is true mm -hmm. because AI, as, as much as this gentleman might not like to believe it, there's a tidal wave on shore. Um, AI's coming. So how? Who? Who are the police, Atusa? Who, who are the police who are gonna? Who are these people who are gonna audit them and enforce it on China or the US or Mr. Trump? Mm -hmm. It's not a large, It's only now become a large language model, <laughs> sir. Before you were you were typing into Google. Now you're just asking it a question as a human. And uh, as the professor said, it's near enough got the potential to pretend to be a human. 75% of people can't tell the difference between a human and AI. Yeah. Yeah. said, do you want to make a stab at that one? Yeah. OK, so, um, so I think in, uh, like ideally in democratic societies, uh, people uh, believe or the, 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 the citizens and the, the govern governments in the democratic societies believe that um, through uh, you know democratic deliberation we can bring in new institutions and this policing kind of action would be would be done through uh, institutions and these institutions come into play when various kind of like experts um, kind of deliberate together and then push forward for uh, for the uh, for a specific kind of institutions that it's supposed to do this kind of policy policing now super nuanced right and then no 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 government in the world is like perfectly perfectly democratic and there are all these indexes and there are a spectrum of different kinds of um, um kinds of um, yeah democratic uh, positions but so basically i think what we what we have the best thing we have is that um in uh, the democracy would help us to bring in institutions auditing institutions in in place um, and I also want to kind of give credit to a lot of um, AI ethicists um, like uh, like Timnit Gebru, like Meg Mitchell, who have all been computer scientists who did um, a lot of AI ethics work. And they try to really introduce uh, critical ways of uh, thinking about auditing, um, how to design auditing systems, how to design participatory mechanisms that uh, would allow us to bring in some interesting auditing um, institutions in place. So there's... There is a lot of work there. It's, it's not perfect. What I am personally concerned about, and I think we need to really think about this more carefully, is that all of these institutions um, would be introduced at a national level, but these um, AI systems and there's also like this competition between these different kind of institutions is happening at a global level. We do not have global governance, and, and it looks like we don't want to have kind of like global governance because history has shown that it's very hard and yeah it's very hard so kind of we have decided those kinds of questions aside and now a lot of these competitions a lot of these uh, questions regulatory questions they are all uh, very important uh, and, and like they, they arise at the global level because we do not have like a global governance structure it's very hard to uh, to answer them and i think that's a that's a space where we need to do much more work and we need to kind of become a little bit more mature um, I, I, I think, I mean, what you say about global governance is, is I, th I think you, you can see the, the problems or the lack of that in so many different aspects of, of, of our lives. You know, the climate crisis, where's the global governance in, in, in that? But, but your, your point about democracy and the importance of democratic institutions having, having the powers to, to regulate, having the powers to, to set up... Um, frameworks or, or codes of behavior and controlling what what is or isn't legitimate how how do we how do we ensure that those democratic systems themselves aren't um, a target for bad actors through ai as we know has been you know through you know facebook trump you know we, we, we don't we don't need to what, what, you know is is the only way that we can ensure that that global governance system, or are there other mechanisms? Are there other things we need to think about at a national or maybe supranational, but not quite global um, level uh, 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 around protecting democracy? 
Yeah, this, this is just such an important question and a very difficult one. And again, as I mentioned, um, I don't think we have uh, even one single example of a like a perfect democratic government where everything is is being done. Like, of course, we have examples of more idealistic global governments, but then we also have these lobbying entities, and it's not clear exactly how these lobbying entities are really undermining democracy or they are like really helping democracy to strive. So there, there are a lot of complicated like political dynamics happening at different stages. And then ideally, the, the goal is that um, the, the like independent viewers should should be embedded into many of these companies, and then there should be new like institutions that oversight what is happening, propose what should be done to the government. Um, and so basically, there should be a lot of like deliberation at different uh, stages, like civic like civic assembly, small like deliberations, and those. Um, kind of result of those deliberations should be fed into bigger institutions. And then hopefully through this whole complicated um, kind of uh, ecosystem, uh, there would be some democratically elected uh, institutions that would be able to audit audit the systems. Like that's, that's I think, the best, uh, the best kind of proposal that is available out there. Um, I think at the moment there, there are a lot of interesting work that people are doing to bring in, um, to kind of like... Um, break down these ideals of democracy into like smaller, uh, more local kind of entities. They want to, uh, there are lots of different efforts, people trying to um, educate um, like small civic assemblies together and then teach them how things are going forward, how they think about regulation, what kind of auditing mechanisms should be put forward. And ideally like there, there should be an aggregation mechanism and those information would be fed into um, into uh, discussions about about the national and global regulation, but like all work in progress. Mm. Okay, thank you. Another one or two questions from, from the audience. I think we've got time for towards the front at the end here. Thanks. What I would say is, is just two things, really, two points. The first is there have always been con artists, and and one of the features I think. Of, 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 of con men and, or, 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 or women or whatever, is, is they're, all, they're very convincing. And part of the defence is being aware that there are people who maybe don't have your interest really at heart, however convincing they are. And I think people have a false belief, some people, in, in AI, that it will be right. And when you're looking at a situation like doing part of the work of a radiologist. Um, I've no doubt that, that the, 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 the information that's being given is, 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 is as unbiased and correct as possible. So it's a different kind, in a sense, of AI from the other kind of AI, like even chat GPT. I mean, chat GPT, I mean, it's the ultimate of garbage in, garbage out. Um, somebody I know in Cambridge um, was bored because he was stuck at home because his, his family kept getting COVID. So he, he asked it about uh, a course that he runs, him, or a group that he runs himself called the Armchair Economist. And Chat GPT knew a lot about this, and some of what it said was correct, but a lot of it was just sheer rubbish that it had, had it, it come up with um, as, as something likely. And it didn't distinguish them. So I think the education of people that just because it's AI doesn't mean it's going to be right. Mm -hmm. I think that's a big defence. And that comes right that, 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 that comes back to sorry, that comes back to the question that, that point around raising awareness and, and, and education across the board, not just for people who are working in this area. Yeah. Yeah. Probably got time for one one more question. And I've got somebody at the front third row, third row back on, on the other end. Thank you. Hi, I, I'm sorry, this, is, this will probably sound a, is possibly a bit trite, but I'm a journalist, uh, so I do apologize. But basically, um, given all what we've discussed over the last uh, hour and a half, isn't the fundamental challenge uh, when artificial intelligence, however that is defined, runs slap back into natural ignorance. Okay. 
who, who wants to take that? George, just your I team. I mean, I don't know if I can address the question directly, but I think it, it points to the, to the comment that the, the lady uh, said before about garbage in, garbage out. Um, I think we make the, the wrong assumption that first the data that we are using is, is, is correct. There's always going to be errors in the data, so, so the system will learn from errors. And the second assumption that, that we make is that if we had two humans or more than two humans discussing the same topic, that they would agree always with each other, which is not the case either. So we will most likely disagree even in the discussion of half a day, even two experts, maybe they are scientists, maybe they are professors, maybe they are healthcare experts, they might disagree on the same evidence. So they see the same picture and the same, say, medical image, and they might say, you know, different diagnosis. So I think there is inherent issue about the fact that some problems are hard even for humans to solve. So then how do we expect an AI system by default to be better when even humans would disagree with each other on, this, on the exact same topic? So for me, it's very important to raise awareness and, and I, as the lady said before, that we have to make sure that people know that the systems quite often will fail or give answers that are not really correct and we have to scrutinize the, this process in the same way that if you meet someone randomly in the street and you know, they ask you a question and you respond back to them uh, and vice versa, I don't think you'll be expecting for them to believe you or, or to trust you. So you always be thinking, do I trust this person? Do I know this person? How do I establish this, this kind of trust ecosystem? And, and we tend to kind of be a bit more cautious sometimes. We kind of establish the barriers and we have to have someone, you know, to speak many times or to establish, uh, you know, a relationship before we trust someone. So I don't see AI being too much different than that. So, but at the moment, we just believe that if I uh, go on whatever browser you're using, you, you know, you put the URL and you use ChatGPT, we assume that the outcome of that system will be uh, correct, but that's not the case. So I, I think that's what we have to, to, you know, to digest a bit, I think. Otherwise, it's not going to be a debate whether we can use uh, a system or not. Brian, do you want to come in? Yeah, and, and that comes back to responsibility. Uh, again, you know, for companies who generate the outputs of this, for it to sound very real to somebody and not say this is a mathematical model and the likelihood that this answer is 80%, you read something and you think it's fact the way that it's actually phrased. You know, it's the responsibility of these companies to actually share that some of that information so you can make a, a decision on it. So when I asked about, tell me about Brian Hills, it said, don't know about Brian Hills, he's not famous enough. That's OK, I've got a thick ego. So I thought, well, how do I get more info? Tell me about Brian Hills at the Data Lab. It was OK, and then it said I'd worked for two companies I'd never worked for before. In a way that if you read it, you, thought, you would have thought I'd worked for those companies. But there's no button to say, explain how you got to this, what's the probability, etc. So you know, back to the responsibility of how these things are being developed and the regulation, I think that's very important. And it also links into uh, the lady's earlier point about educating the public on this and how to ask the right questions of these new technologies. You don't need to be a data scientist, but we would all benefit, I think, from phrasing or coming together and saying, what are the top three questions I should ask when I'm engaging with one of these technologies to get a recommendation or an output? And, and Atusa, do you have anything to, on, on that, that specific question? Uh. I think we also need to uh, kind of be um, be careful that we can use these systems in many different ways. So one is that we can just, for example, use ChatGPT and take whatever it says as like the final word. I think that is really wrong. That is very dangerous. But sometimes you can just take it as like a drafting of the idea, you know, as a, a, a reasoning machine that helps you to generate some new ideas. Many of them would be bullshit. Some of them might be good. You know, I know a lot of uh, professors that use ChatGPT to write very glorious recommendation letters for their students. So what they do is that they give a couple of bullet points. <laughs> this is for my student, mm -hmm. like write two page recommendation, uh, like a recommendation uh, letter. And then, of course, they take that and they, they kind of personalize that. But that allows uh, that kind of content generation uh, allows them to be a little bit more effective and like don't do some some maybe like boring things or use the systems to, to kind of help them to speed up writing the system. So there are some, as, um, as I think the other panelists also mentioned, you, uh, positive use cases of these systems where we can just use them, you know, as like, um, as like collaborators or as things that can help us to do brainstorming. 
Uh, but of course, yeah, exactly this idea of whatever they generate, we take it for granted. We don't check the, 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 the references. We don't check the content. That, that's very dangerous. And I think we should really avoid that. Thank you. We're coming, we're coming to the end of our time. But before we close, I just want to ask our panelists to, to sum up um, in a minute or, or, or two. Um, what would you recommend or what, what, what would you be looking for to happen in the space of an ethical approach to AI or, or AI ethics in Scotland? What would you look for the Scottish Government and for other public institutions in Scotland to be doing around, it might be around regulation, we've talked about education, we've talked about auditing, we've talked about a whole range of different things. Um, what, 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 what should we take away from, from this evening's discussion for work that we still need to do in Scotland? <laughs> and Tushar, I'll start with you and then we'll work uh, along the, the, the platform. Okay, great. So I think, um, like, I, I just want to be very, uh, very clear with you on, on this. A lot of these questions are very complicated. We need to think about them um, by engaging many different stakeholders. And then we need to think about these questions together. They're like open questions. There is no solution. No one in the world knows exactly where should we go. There are some voices that are, that are louder and they, they push forward. Uh, some ideas and some other voices that are less loud. So I think the most important thing for me would be just to engage more and more citizens and involve citizens into into this whole discussions and and, and allow them to uh, to know more about about what is really happening, ask their opinion. You know, this should become like a you know dinner table kind of like discussion without. Uh, having fear without invoking fear or super crazy excitement that these systems are going to kill all of us or replace all of humans. I think these discussions go nowhere. But just mm -hmm. trying to like follow up on what is what these systems are really doing in our real world, but also having like a futuristic ideas about where we are going, right? So even if we haven't lost a lot of jobs or labor market is not still uh, changed much in Scotland, we have seen a couple of very interesting reports that, for example, uh, OpenAI uh, released. So they, they, they made an expectation of how uh, they think large language models would change uh, the landscape of labor market in, in the United States. I think it would be amazing if various different stakeholders in Scotland uh, also do something similar. And when there are this kind of like empirical investigations um, or findings, then, then the public can be more engaged according to like written reports, according to some informed numbers. And, uh, and I would love to see exactly this kind of like informed discussion with citizens. And I think that's, that's the right ethical way to take in tackling the social implications of the system. Thanks very much, Atisha. Brian? Uh, two things for me. So Mr. Lockhead, who's the Minister responsible for AI strategy, uh, has commissioned a review of where we are and has asked the chair of the AI Alliance to review uh, progress and what we need to do next for Scotland and AI. Um, so that's in progress just now. As I explained earlier, a lot of that focus to date has been societal engagement. Mm -hmm. So I'd be looking for that, as to Atusa's point, you know, to be ramped up further, uh, as well as viewing on the education perspective and the industry uh, perspective too. So that, that's in progress just now. Another thing for me that I see a lot that I would really like um, to see move forward fast is education of the public sector. Um, and so the, uh, as part of the AI strategy, we created an AI register. So anybody in the public services using AI can register how they're using it and can look for guidance and collaboration, etc. It's not mandatory just now. I'd le love to see it mandatory in a community of practice around that to help our public sector adopt them in the right way and learn from, from when things haven't worked. So in South, um, South Ayrshire, I think, they took a facial recognition system into a school. Uh, to help during COVID times and help efficiency, etc. And there's a lot of feedback, and they stopped that fairly quickly. You know, I, I'd like us to be in a position where we can help our public sector understand this technology and help them to make the right decisions. Thanks very much, Brian and George. Yeah, from my perspective, I think we should not be panicking and, and see. Um, say that GPT or large language models has been the end of, of the journey because it's very easy to uh, go down the route of regulating something that in, in a couple of months time or in a year from now is going to be obsolete. So I think we have to see beyond that. So I, th I think that's the first point. So I, I would like to see the governments uh, bringing the universities together, the public sector, industry and having this discussion and see the bigger picture, not just you know stick with the, with the current example because that's just an example. It's not 
it is not the end of the journey. And the second thing is that, finishing with a more positive <laughs> note here, is, is the, the element of regulation we discussed before. I think one of the very good things I've seen uh, in AI community is the fact that the AI community itself is policing the other part of the AI community. Mm -hmm. So maybe something that is, is not very, many people might, might not know about that, is that before ChatGPT came out, there was a similar system from Meta, the Facebook. Uh, and because there was a huge, uh, uh, you know, discussion on Twitter, many, you know, uh, very eminent AI scientists, they kind of uh, went very against this kind of system to, that was deployed at that point publicly, and Meta sat it down. Um, so there were examples where it was recommending uh, recipes, you know, eating broken glass because it's, it's, uh, it's nutritious and so on. So there were many bad examples, and they sat it down. So I think the positive side is that the AI community itself is aware of those issues, and it's not just everybody's pushing, you know, to develop technologies that's just not fit for, for purpose. So I think that's that's a very positive thing. But the governments have to support this mechanism with funding, with with support, with you know students. You know, the ecosystem has to be there to be able to do that at scale. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we we have to end it there. Can I begin by thanking our panelists, Atusha, Brian, and Georgios? Thank you. <laughs> Can I thank you all, you all for coming along this evening and for your, your thoughtful questions and quite challenging questions for us. I thank also our partners at the University of Edinburgh for their support in putting this evening on. As one of the directors of, this, of Scotland's Futures Forum, I must also plug its work on this issue. Um, we have developed a toolkit of questions to consider when using and engaging with AI to ensure, among other things, the ethics of AI have been considered. Um, all of the Scotland's Futures Forum's work is publicly available on the website, so do go, go along and have a look. Can I also remind you, please fill in one of the, the surveys um, for, for today's event, if, if you can. And there's still a little bit of, of time left in the Festival of Politics this year. A couple more events to plug, one on aviation and the sustainability agenda at 5.45, followed by a discussion on Scotland's music venues with the wonderful musician Hamish Hawke at 6 p.m. And then in a couple of weeks' time, we have a special In Conversation with um, Gustavo Dudamel, who is one of the world's foremost conductors. They, again, there's more information about that downstairs. Thank you again for coming along, for participating in this year's Festival of Politics, and we hope to see you again next year, if not before. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.